Have you ever had a dream you couldn't wake up from? Spent the waking hours of the dark in a nightmare you couldn't escape? The first time I stepped into the gothic-inspired city of Yarnam, I was instantly transported back to all the terrifying images of my nightmares that used to keep me up at night as a child. And I remember being there, praying the monsters didn't live underneath my bed, fearful that if I turned out the lights, they'd come after me, snatch me up in the middle of the night, hold my mouth shut so I couldn't scream and never let me wake up. Of every game I've played, Bloodborne recreates this feeling of horror I had as a child more than any other. And completing the game a second time five years later, it has lost none of its poignancy. The fact of the matter is that Bloodborne isn't a horror game, but it is filled with more disturbing and chilling subject material than most horror games, and the integration of it is also much stronger. Instead of the typical jump scare horror game that we've seen so many times before, Bloodborne builds this horror as a world and every line of code written serves to submerge you in this evocative, horrible, hair-raising state of being, never letting go through its 30-plus hour, beautifully ghastly tale, all the while surrounding you with an absolutely enchanting, Victorian-inspired, gothic world that just drips with detail. What I've always loved about From's games is the organic nature of play and presentation. In Bloodborne, most everything is left unsaid, and very few cutscenes are placed inside the game to set context or explain anything in terms of narrative. Rarely does the game ever steal control away from you either to gloat in a fancy critical on-screen detail that you may experience in the wrong light, which is often so annoying in games because they just scream, hey you, look at this, just for the sake of showing off or forcing predetermined interactions. In Bloodborne, players instead venture off and make what they want of it, exploring, wandering off, surmising, and fitting pieces together, which in turn creates a very unique gameplay experience. Normally, leaving everything in the hands of the player themselves can create confusion in a very bad way, stifling motivation and possibly encouraging many to quit before they unpack what they need to understand a game in an intimate way. But history has taught us that players love the Oasis and the refuge of From Software's titles, and Bloodborne is definitely no exception. Nay, Bloodborne drops you off into the bleak dark night with only the smallest taste of what, why, how, or who. Just like walking into the iconic Boreal Valley Vista in Dark Souls 3, typically Bloodborne simply leaves you to stumble into discovery, and really that's what I love about it. Being unforceful in this fashion helps set a great mood as other details do too. Things like thudding sound effects, wonderful aesthetics, and music that's mostly absent in non-boss play, which saves the frequency for some very unnerving atmospheric sounds. A haunting evening wind, an axe being dragged upon the ground, a crackling bonfire, or a shriek from an unknown monster. Strange women cackle behind locked wooden doors, a children's music box rings a haunting lullaby, and church bells clang in lantern-lit streets. Bloodborne is a master at environmental immersion, as the pale glow from the great moon offers very little guidance through this mastery of an introductory level. At first, a labyrinth going every which way, up and down, left and right, although in reality it's quite seamlessly interconnected, which is a hallmark of Miyazaki's brilliant mind. Tis a reflection as well of Bloodborne in its entirety, a world that was designed with an incredible attention to detail and complexity, yet the entire game just feels very connected and rational. It's the density that sells it. Secret passageways, hidden bosses, and shortcuts connect the maze of Bloodborne, offering a very pleasant means to progression. Adventuring through Bloodborne feels authentic because exploration is self-made, as players carve out tiny sections of the game that then loop around or connect to previously discovered areas, offering that very wonderful sense of relief when players reach new lamps or unlock ways forward that circumvent areas already tackled. This gameplay loop has an incredibly immersive quality to it because its mystique is told passively through this exploration, interactions with NPCs, item descriptions, and small environmental details. It just draws you in. You can play the entire game ignorant to the story and have a great time, knowing very little about the hunter's nightmare. Or you can really get invested, dive into the foggy presentation by doing just a little bit extra, speaking to strangers through windows to learn stuff, 
reading a note for a small insight, going into menus and translating cryptic item descriptions, talking to NPCs more than once, helping those that ask for aid or possibly defying them, killing them if you want to, I don't really care, it's just about the choice. This exercise in existing in an organic world where it's just really up to you. Then speculating about the mysteries and putting it together yourself over repeat playthroughs while picking up on tiny nuances to fill in those missing pieces. This basic exercise of having players observe, question, and then discover awards an extreme amount of wonderlust as players explore all the nukes and crannies of the game, backtrack into every corner and odd place on the chance to stumble upon something just extra, some extra gameplay device, hidden story beat, or lore thread. And by god, is there a tremendous amount to unpack. Perhaps it's bumping into a young girl perched on a window who gives you a music box to give to her missing daddy. Maybe it's dying on purpose to reach a secret zone, or finding a forsaken castle which will lead you to another quest, another boss that you may not know was even present in the game. These are just but a tiny fraction of optional things to experience within Bloodborne and its DLC, all dependent on how adventuring and inquisitive the hunter. For the curious player, what results is a very absorbing gameplay loop where you truly become immersed in Bloodborne, scrubbing through all the teeny details and accessories, offshoot NPC stories, insights, illusions, and twisted secrets ill-informed, but not for the sake of completion or to check off a box in a quest journal, but as a self-motivating exercise of wanting to get to know Bloodborne more intimately because it feels so intangible, layered, and gripping. Though extended play amplifies this discovery process, especially through improvements of player competency and map knowledge, the true beauty of Bloodborne is the naive first playthrough. Confused, lost, unsuspecting, and with wary feet you travel slowly, tippy-toeing around half wondering what's around every corner, and half afraid of taking those steps for fear of a sudden death. But the game pushes you forward, encouraging that adventure through very fast and vicious gameplay. And in that gameplay, darkness haunts the streets, the chapels, the workshops, the swamps, and the forests, horror so grotesque as to make you stare aghast at the sights and the sounds. Phantoms without eyes, gargoyles, spiders, shades, undead figures, zombies, and freakish beasts conjured up by the most imaginative and twisted. So when I think of this imagery, I always go back to three things. Number one is the Orphan of Cost, first of all, which is this alien creature jittery thing that you fight and he uses a placenta as his weapon and he's this is disgusting uh, number two is Ludwig which is this kind of giant undead death dog thing that has this eyeball problem and he, he looks really gross and number three most of all is not even a boss it's actually the winter lantern which is this giant bulbous brain thing that sits atop a torn bloody doll cloak but then underneath you can kind of see there's like a gangly human bipedal frame with these tiny little twig arms and legs it's gross it's like what the sandwich fuck is this and, oh, and then the sound it makes oh, the sound And as you travel this world, strange cries, groans, sobs, and terrible screams echo all around you, unique to each area, whether it be the chanting of nearby voices in a cathedral, the bleak silence of a decrepit forest, or the eerie bells of a chime maiden. The atmosphere is powerful and it draws you in, so you adventure forward, but the path ahead is split in three different ways. Three directions with three uncertain futures. Take the left and you may find your way out of this place. Take the right, and well then you may enter a twisting labyrinth of buildings and curving sewers only to get lost and have to backtrack. Take the middle route, well who knows. That's the beauty of Bloodborne. Bloodborne is a contorted weaving knot, a brilliantly designed world full of areas that feel open yet very claustrophobic, vast yet very dense confusing yet very rational, but still always feeling very authentic with its gruesomely awesome amount of detail. Not just visually, but the atmosphere, the music, and the chilling sound effects of the monsters, and of course that fantastic rapping world design. It's the harmony between the maddening and the enchanting that strikes beautiful balance, because madness lurks in all of its beauty. Such dark romance and imagination has created some of the most horrid bosses ever seen, and fighting them is so fun, but so terrifying. Truly, Bloodborne does the impossible job of making horrible things look and sound beautiful, whether it's the dimly lit churches, the ghastly monsters you fight, and the terrible things you see and hear. It is one of the most well-realized, dark fantasy games that has ever been made. 
I know I've been harping on about it for far too long, but I've been trying to say just one thing. Bloodborne is immersive. It fits the gameplay beautifully as you'll be fighting to survive this very desolate nightmare while at the same time working out the puzzle of its world structure. Part of learning Bloodborne isn't related to combat, it's discovering the route through the game and making sure you don't miss out on anything. But then the fierce sudden difficulty of a boss or the unnerving feeling of dying makes the perfect counterpoint to wandering around the world as you'll often have to decide whether to turn back or push on. As with Dark Souls, death comes quick and it can be very painful depending on the location of your demise. Thus, total progression in Bloodborne is the sum of exploration and your willingness to continue, which strikes a brilliant balance. It makes you feel on edge, constantly worried that the game will throw something at you that you can't handle, making you enter a state where you're constantly nervous, fucking paranoid, hoping you won't die. But slowly over time, you acclimate yourself to this feeling and you absorb it. You acclimate yourself to the world as well, pushing out just a little bit further each time, collecting items and upgrading your kit, slaying the foul beast that destroyed you hours before with this weird newfound sense of confidence, coming back for vengeance as you get more comfortable with sticky situations, once thought to be unfair combat or ridiculous platforming, only to conquer them all, which will lead you to new areas and discovery organically. Far removed from any progression tree in a menu, this is the game's way of creating natural, player-driven, satisfying progression. Bloodborne's new gameplay tweaks help support this endeavor, which make the game feel completely unique. No shield, streamlined weapon management, no equip load, no refillable potions, no ranged weapons, nor magic-based spells for the most part, demanding that you become battle-tested in melee range, fight back with agility and timing in replace of that block button. And the switch to partial healing upon damage magnifies this tension, allowing players to aggress not just to finish off foes, but to save themselves from critical damage as well. This visceral, constant combat ensures that you will very quickly become glazed in blood and get up and close and personal with the horrible creatures of Bloodborne, as a hunter should. Everything just makes Bloodborne feel like more of an action game than an RPG, though many elements like character stats and weapon upgrading do exist to satisfy those who need a little bit of customization, however being much more streamlined naturally. Such small changes have a dramatic effect on the overall combat pacing of Bloodborne, and I feel like it's one of the strongest combat systems of any game in the genre. Frantic, bloody, and frightening, it's the kind of gameplay system that is immediately fun, yet not too unfamiliar as to become so far distanced from Souls. The best part is the payoff of overcoming challenges with this new system is second to none. Like all Souls games, Bloodborne has a fantastic reward curve that makes all the struggle worth it, as when you finally defeat the bosses that kick the crap out of you for the past three hours, you feel filled with satisfaction and glee. Death in Bloodborne never feels cheap or fair either, as if you died it was probably your fault so conquering the game and improving has this very addictive and fair quality to it. In all honesty, it's a combat system that still feels fantastic after all these years. And that's how I really feel about this entire game. Much like my nightmares as a kid, I still think about Bloodborne's most twisted, and in no way, shape, or form did playing the game a second time discount any memories I had of the game. It only amplified my satisfaction. I was able to see many new things, complete the quests I missed, actually beat the DLC, and dive deeper into the Chalice Dungeons, which are flat out one of the biggest reasons to continue playing Bloodborne. Outside of faster frame rates, honestly there's nothing really major I'd ever change about Bloodborne because it's a game that is so strong, and I'd recommend playing it as one of the must-have games on the market even five years later.